Good afternoon. Today we are going to talk about a new and emerging topic in medicine, that of the microbiome, and see how it relates to the study and management of kidney diseases. So I think the first question is to just do with some of the definitions. So there are two terms which are used quite frequently. One, uh, microbiota, and the second is microbiome. So what is the difference between the two? Microbiota relates to all the microorganisms that we can identify that live in a particular environment, for example, the human body. Now, the subtle difference between microbiota and microbiome is something which is important to appreciate, that in the definition of a microbiome, you don't identify organisms, but you look at the collection of genes found in all of the microbes associated with the particular host. And many of the, for many of these genes, one would not really know which of the individual microbe these particular genes came from. But that's, that's an important difference which will become obvious in the next few slides. So what it allows us to do is to look at a molecular view of microbial diversity in the entire biosphere. So if you look at the, the organisms, you can divide them into three broad groups. One is the group of bacteria, second is the group of archaea, and the third is the group of eukarya. So what is the difference between the first two and the third? So first two, the bacteria and archaea are prokaryotes, which means that they don't have a well-defined cell wall. Whereas eukarya are eukaryotes, which means that they have a well-defined cell wall. And here you have the homo genus, in which comes homo sapiens, which is the species of humans. And you can see that in the entire uh, microbial diversity, and the, where the biosphere is, we are very close to corns, really, which are also uh, eukaryotes, right? So then let's look at what features, other than just the presence of uh, definable cell wall, distinguish the microbial domains. So you have a bacteria which, have, like I said, have no nucleus or membrane. They also don't have any membrane-bound organelles. And they can be round or they can be a little elongated or rod-shaped, but there can be other shapes of bacteria as well, such as filamentous bacteria, uh, and, and so on. Now, archaea bacteria or the archaea also do not have any nucleus or membrane bound organisms. They can look similar to bacteria or they can have drastically different shapes also, which are in, in some ways different from bacteria, such as they can be flat, they can be square. But in addition to these similarities to the prokaryotes, which are the bacteria, they can also have some metabolic similarities to eukaryotes. Now, eukaryotes actually have a true nucleus and have multiple membrane-bound organelles like the mitochondria, like the endoplasmic reticulum, uh, like the lysosomes, and so on. And they can assume a wide variety of shapes. We know that a neuronal cell or a renal a meson a mesenchymal cell or, or a blood cell, they are all very differently shaped. So now let's come to the cells in human body. So it might come as a surprise to you that a human body is actually about 25% or in fact much less than 25% human cells. The rest is many thousands of species of bacteria and other microbes. So this is how it has been de depicted graphically and this could be human cells or the size of the pie could be actually smaller than this and a vast majority of these cells are bacterial cells and a smaller proportion of fungal cells as shown here and I think the diversity will become even more apparent later on. So the immediate question is, where are these cells and what are they doing uh, in the human body? So these cells are present in, in many human organs. They are present in, in the oral cavity, they are present in the lungs, they are present in the gut, which we'll discuss in great detail. They are present in the genital urinary tract, they are present on the skin. So wherever the human body is exposed to the outside world, there is a microbial community. Now, what is it doing there? It is helping us to extract energy and nutrients from the food we eat, and it crowds out or inhibits pathogens. So you would be familiar with the term commensals. So these are commensal organisms. So like we said, my microbiome contributes an extra uh, 8 million genes to the about 20 
thousand gene human genome. So the ratio of uh, microbial genome is to human genome is about three hundred to one. And like I said, the uh, the exact estimate of the number of microbial cell varies, but it is approximately between ten and hundred trillion cells. Now we did talk about bacteria in the previous slide, but viruses outnumber bacteria also by a ratio of five is to one. Despite such large numbers, the microbiome weight is only 1.2 kilos and volume is almost similar, 1.3 liters. So let's now ask the question, how do we get our microbiome? So the microbiome acquisition process starts at the time of birth. A newborn gets its microbes from its mother's birth canal and also from the skin of its mother and of the other caregivers who almost immediately pick up a baby after it is born. The next source of microbial uh, colonization comes from the breast milk, which has been fine-tuned to over millions of years to provide nutrients, vitamins, and antibiotics, but it also provides diverse microbes to populate the baby's gut. And the third important source is, of course, the environment, because for the rest of the baby's life, it will continuously encounter new microbes from soil and water, people, pets, plants, and new and diverse foods that it, uh, the baby will encounter for the rest of his or her life. So much so that now it is believed that every single individual has a different microbial profile. And it has been suggested that we might even have a microbial fingerprint and that a study of microbiome in an individual could perhaps replace the identity of the individual in future, but that seems to be a little bit like science fiction at this particular So now let's look at how the alteration of microbiome in human body relates to disease. And this is a picture of Elia Mechnikov, who described to whom the term dysbiosis is uh, attributed. And many people feel that this attribution is actually inaccurate. So he is credited with giving uh, or advancing the hypothesis that an imbalanced intestinal microbial community with qualitative and quantitative changes in composition and metabolic activities can lead to disease. And this is linked to what is called the hygiene hypothesis or the old friends hypothesis that human beings are very old friends with their microbial community and that altered microbiome due to hygienic practices such as repeated hand washes can be responsible for surge in autoimmune diseases. So this is something which has been uh, advanced much more recently, uh, much after the time of Elia Mechnikov. So how does this happen? So like we described, so this is the uh, microbial community. You have the fungi, you have the bacteria, you have the viruses. And like I said, they start from the term, time of maternal exposure and over a period of time they evolve and they form the viral, bacterial and eukaryotic microbiota. And we study them by the study of their genes. So once you have these, uh, you, you just study these genes, but, but the product of these microbes, they circulate in the blood. So they have their expression products and so the transcript of, of these is often called metatranscriptome. Metatranscriptome means information associated with transcriptome. And this has uh, been led to, uh, uh, this has been said to lead to pro-inflammatory states uh, and a number of cytokines which are listed here. And, and they might, they have been linked to development of a number of disorders such as neurological disorders, autism, etc. And also a number of other somatic diseases like uh, diseases, uh, even malignancy, hepatic disorders, obesity, diabetes, uh, autoimmune diseases like atopic dermatitis, uh, sexually transmissible disorders. And this, in the center, you see that uh, the microbiome uh, can vary depending on where it sits, such as you have a, a different microbial community in the hair and in, in the eye, in the auditory canal, in the nostrils, in the oral cavity, of course, breast milk in, in women. Uh, lungs and the respiratory tract, gastrointestinal tract, rectum, urogenital tract, and sexual organs. Of course, skin and cutaneous uh, tissue 
and this is all actually uh, interacted by new vaccines, drug targets, and immunotherapeutics, which alter the microbial and diversity of human body. So now let's come and discuss uh, in greater detail the gut microbiome. And here, uh, one can pick up a quote from Hippocrates uh, in around 400 before Christ, who said, death sits in the bowels, and a bad digestion is the root of all evil. And it can be actually broken down uh, to mean that uh, Hippocrates was talking about microbiome, but of course Hippocrates did not understand microbiota at that particular point of time. So gut colonization it begins immediately after birth uh, from breast milk and so on. And initial bacterial colonization starts from uh, germ-free intrauterine involvement and, and it is populated through maternal, vaginal or fecal flora and oral feeding. Uh, initially breast milk and later on uh, use of formula might change it. Uh, by about three years of life, the gut microbiome reaches uh, a, a status where it is more or less akin to an adult colonization state. A number of factors affect gut microbiome and shown here in the top panel. So they could be linked to genetics, birth route. So if a baby is born through cesarean section, the baby misses out on, on the on the uh, contribution of the birth canal. Uh, of course, geography has an important bearing on, on the microbial uh, diversity. Uh, living in, in Norway is going to be very different in, in, in deciding what kind of microbes are present in the gut than living in India or in Africa. Uh, and it, to some extent, it is, it is affected by the hygiene, then stress, diet, nutrition, and use of drugs, especially antibiotics, anti-cancer drugs, and so on will have uh, uh, their impact on, on microbiome. Now, microbial changes can take place, like I said, uh, adult my gut microbiome is reached by the year of, by, by, by the age of three years, but alteration in uh, microbial diversity in, of the gut can, can start right at, at that time, and it could be then link, uh, called early onset, and it uh, changes in micro, uh, gut microbiome can, can take place during adulthood and also later in life. Now, it is important to realize that the state of health is associated with greater degree of microbial complexity and stability. So you have more health and less disease. But as the microbial complexity and stability decreases, the state of health goes down and a disease state supervenes. So you have this green line showing healthy microbiome. And perturbation can take place, like I said, at different stages, early, uh, adult onset, and it, uh, at all stages, it is linked to development of infections, metabolic diseases, and inflammatory disorders. Uh, and a healthy microbial uh, community protects against pathogens, they train and stimulate immune function, they supply nutrients, energy, uh, vitamins, short chain fatty acids, and so on. But in a disease state, you have a state of inflammation, which could be either local or systemic, oxidative stress, increase in gram-negative bacteria, infections which could be either pathogenic or opportunistic infection, and alteration in production. This is a slightly closer view of, uh, of uh, uh, the microbial community in the gut. So look at, uh, I will try to explain to you some of the, some of the signs. So you have, this is, this is, uh, this expresses a symbiont, which means that this is a health, this is a microorganism which is present in the healthy gut. This is the gut mucosa, you have uh, the microvilli here, and you have the, the blood side here. And here you, you see these, these black uh, organisms or blue organisms, these are uh, rather sinister looking pathobionts or, or pathogenetic organisms, right? And here you have in the, in the, in the red uh, around uh, dots, you have lipopolysaccharides, which you, can, which you can see here, these are the lipopolysaccharides, and uh, the blue dots you have here, these are pro-inflammatory cytokines. So uh, suppose in, in the stage of chronic kidney disease, a number of things take place. The fiber intake goes down, which reduces gut motility. There is metabolic acidosis. There is use of antibiotics, phosphate binders, antimetabolites. There is an increased intestinal excretion of urea, uric acid, and oxalate. And all these promote the proliferation of pathogenic microorganisms. You also have 
a number of other alterations which lead which consist of for example here impaired intestinal barrier which uh, which is because of reduced mucus reduced defense in reduced epithelial survival and reduced intestinal uh, uh, transit time uh, endothelial junction uh, you have dysregulation of immune response you have protein and carbohydrate fermentation or the bile acid metabolism which leads to increase in uremic toxins reduce short chain fatty acids and reduce deoxypolic acid and lithopolic acid which is the bile salts and uh, as a result of dysregulation of immune response you have altered uh, cytokine profile leading to inflammation now you also have other things such as hypoperfusion which in, and all this in combination uh, leads to alteration in uh, epithelial uh, junction you have movement of dendritic cell between between the cells which alter which uh, worsens the altered immune response and as a result of everything you have some of these pathobionts also escaping into into the circulation and you have in the circulation a number of pro-inflammatory cytokines and lipopolysaccharides all of which can uh, participate in either disease development or in uh, manifestation of uh, uh, manifestation of symptoms many of these organisms lead to increased in urea increase in urea leads to increase in ammonia synthesis in increased ammonium blocks the uh, blocks block development of uh, commensal organisms and promote the growth of uh, pathogenic microorganisms so that is another process now we all have heard a lot about uremic toxins and they are known for uh, at least 30 40 years but until we understood well the gut microbiome we, we did not really very well understand the the source of uremic toxins although it was said that they originate in the gut but we didn't understand that very well but now i think we do understand that better that from food you have a number of things such as choline phenylalanine and tyrosine and tryptophan many of these are amino acids and they are broken down by the intestinal bacteria into a number of products like indole precasol and they all are then metabolized in the liver and they go into circulation so you have the phenols you have the indoles you have the amines you have guanidines and phenylacetic acid and hippuric acid and this is all facilitated by increased gut permeability so what are the uh, uremic toxins i think it is not as a surprise to you when uh, i tell you that there are now hundreds of compounds which are presumed to be uh, candidates for uremic toxins and the ones that are listed here have been now postulated to uh, originate in the gut and possibly uh, as a result of the action of gut microbiome so does the gut microbiome also lead to worsening of chronic kidney disease that's an important question which we should try and uh, examine at least we don't have a clear answer to that but there is a theoretical presumption that this can occur that you have a human genome and you have the gut microbiome human genome there, there could be certain abnormalities in, in human genome which might increase susceptibility to chronic kidney disease and there is also possibility that uh, microbiome also contributes to increased susceptibility to chronic kidney disease on top of it when there is a, an external insult also that can lead to a development of chronic kidney disease and as we discussed in the previous slide this leads to dysbiotic microbiome leading to generation of uremic toxins which can further contribute to progression of chronic kidney disease in addition with other risk factors of progression this is also shown in more or less uh, a slightly expanded way as to what could be the uh, the uh, impact of the various uremic toxins which you saw on one of the previous slides so the the amines or the tmao can act on macrophage or foam cell uh, which which uh, through cd38 and, and sra they can actually cause increased ac uh, or acceleration of atherosclerosis right uh, the indoxin sulfate and, and pcs can act on uh, renal tubular cell and again activate a number of uh, uh, signaling pathways through nuclear factor kappa b protein kinase c and pi3 kinase leading on to generation of reactive oxygen species inflammatory cytokines probiotic molecules which can all lead to progression of kidney disease and lipopolysaccharide can activate uh, monocytes and a number of uh, uh, a number of 
transcription factors here uh, lead to uh, the, uh, the activation of the ultimate transcription factor again, NF kappa B, which leads to generation of a number of cytokines, which causes metabolic endotoxinemia, increased inflammation, cardiovascular disease, and mortality. So, in summary, uremic toxins are associated with increased all cause mortality, cardiovascular disease, and progression of chronic kidney disease. Endotoxin translocation causes inflammation in chronic kidney disease, and it also has a possible role in, in progression of atherosclerosis. Short chain fatty acids, which go down, may be involved in inflammation and blood pressure regulation. So this is this seems to be a, a multi pronged attack taking place on multiple uh, disease uh, processes. So what are the common chronic kidney disease related risk factors and complications which might be impacted by microbiome? And the candidates here are also quite diverse. So some of them are risk factors like obesity and type 2 diabetes and others are consequences of chronic kidney disease such as cardiovascular disease, bone mineral metabolism, depression or other cognitive abnormalities and malnutrition. And they have all in some way or the other been linked to altered microbiome. So this is again the same thing shown in a graphical format that you have uremia which leads to impaired protein digestion also to intestinal dysbiosis, altered dietary pattern, decreased fiber intake can lead to decreased saccharolytic bacteria and all of these working together lead to increased delivery of undigested protein to the colon leading to generation of uremic toxins by proliferation of proteolytic bacteria which leads to all these various manifestations. Which, which can range from CNS to protein energy wasting, immune dysregulation, cardiovascular disease, and even progression of chronic disease. So having discussed so far that microbiome is really important and it could be doing a number of things which, which, uh, which lead to uh, worsening of chronic kidney disease and, and contribute to manifestation of chronic kidney disease, how do we study it? So there are two questions. Who is there or who are these bugs and what can they do? So how do we study this is shown here. So you can take a microbiome sample, which can come from any source. They can come from human, they can come from plants. So, but in our case, we are interested in humans. So the first thing that we do is say, for example, for a study of gut microbiome, you take a sample of the stool and you extract DNA from the stool. You don't try to culture and identify organisms because you will be able to identify only a small number of organisms. So you extract the DNA here and, and in, in order to uh, identify, we do now some, uh, some new things which the molecular biologists have taught us. One is that we sequence the 16S ribosomal RNA, which is a sequence of ribosomal RNA which is present in, in uh, prokaryotes and it evolves very slowly. And therefore, it has been used to uh, develop a phylogenetic view of community composition. So this uh, 16S RNA sequencing allows you to identify species and relative frequency of species, not in terms of the names of microorganisms, but the 16S RNA sequence. And this allows us to draw a, a tree, a phylogenetic tree of which allows us to understand uh, which are the various bacteria or microbes which are present here. The second thing that we do is then we do a total microbiome DNA sequencing and you have this DNA, these CNS sequences, uh, so you identify var variants and polymorphisms and it also gives you some functional information. But what are they doing is really understood by, by these other types of uh, studies which, which includes not only genomics which we just discussed, but also transcriptomics uh, which, which tells us uh, what are the types of RNA which are formed, uh, proteomics which tells us what is the translation of this RNA into protein and finally into metabolomics as to show how the proteins work together in various metabolic pathways. So these are the various things one can do to study uh, and understand better how the microbiome is actually affecting us in health and in disease. Now let's come to the study of uh, microbiome and microbiota alteration in chronic kidney disease. I'm not going to uh, describe to you in, in great detail these studies except to say that we are really in very very early stages of these studies. There have been a few studies in, in CKD patients you can see here but you can see the numbers are really very small 22, 24, 24, 10 and healthy persons 8. So it has simply uh, basically the studies have focused on, on 
bacterial self counts and phylogenetic microarrays and uh, 16S RNA, uh, uh, ribosomal RNA amplification and DNA sequencing. And basically it simply has shown that there is a diversity in, uh, in the microbiome of healthy individuals and those with end stage kidney disease. So the microbiomes are different. So this is, these are human studies and there are a number of experiments, animal studies as well. But we need to understand a lot more in what these microbiome uh, alterations are doing by using these other uh, omics studies like metabolomics and proteomics and so on. But having just understood that the microbiome really is changed, can we do anything to change the state of affairs? Uh, because we think that this altered microbiome might be leading to generation of uremic toxins. So the various interventions which, which have been tried consist of probiotics, prebiotics, and symbiotics, and finally just high fiber diet. So what is the difference between these various biotics? So probiotics are live microorganisms which when administered in adequate amounts might confer a health benefit on the host. What are prebiotics? These are non-digestible substances that provide a beneficial physiological effect for the host by selectively stimulating the favorable growth or activity of a limited number of indigenous bacteria rather than these exogenous pathogenic bacteria. Uh, symbiotics are of course combinations of both pro and prebiotics and high fiber diet is a type of prebiotic. Probiotics have been used uh, in the treatment of gastrointestinal disorders a variety of gastrointestinal disorders which have been shown here starting from infectious diarrhea to lactose intolerance to uh, inflammatory bowel disease to H. pylori eradication, a number of conditions. And how do probiotics work? So we have seen a version of this, this photograph and the new thing in this photograph are these green uh, organisms which are now probiotics. So what probiotics can do is that they can they have an antimicrobial property, so they can increase uh, defensins and antimicrobial peptides, reduce pH and reduce pathogenic binding. They can enhance the gut barrier by increasing mucus, increasing epithelial survival, and increasing uh, uh, epithelial uh, tight junctions. Uh, they can increase innate immunity. They can uh, act as anti-inflammatory, uh, and they provide competition for nutrients and also favorably influence bile acid metabolism. As a result of all this, you have decreased the uremic toxin, increase in short chain fatty acid and decrease in ammonium production, increased FGF 1519, and uh, you know, uh, as a result overall, uh, there is a favorable uh, bacterial impact, increase in IgA, uh, and all this leads to cardiovascular protection, improved dysmetabolism, uh, antimicrobial effect, and improved intestinal tract. So what are the characteristics of effective probiotics? They should be able to survive the passage through the digestive system. They should be able to attach to the intestinal epithelia and they should be able to colonize there and they should not get washed off immediately. They should stay viable uh, for a significant period of time. They should be able to utilize the nutrients and substrates in a normal diet so that they deprive the pathogenic bacteria of these nutrients and substrates but of course they should not be pathogenic, they should not be toxic, they should be capable of exerting a beneficial effect on the host and that they should remain stable during processing, processing, storage and transportation because of course they need to be sold as products so they will be processed in a laboratory, they will be stored for varying periods of time uh, in a shop or in the shelf in a patient's home and they will be transported from place to place. There are uh, now emerging number of studies which have investigated the effect of prebiotics and probiotics in patients with chronic kidney disease. Again, the number of subjects treated is really very, very small. And you can see the type of intervention shown in the first column. They have right now varied tremendously uh, and the intervention is not related to prebiotics or probiotics, but basically aimed at altering, uh, altering uh, the microbial flora by other mechanisms also such as use of oral adsorbent, alpha galactosidase inhibitor, ecarbose, which is used for treating uh, individuals with diabetes. And they have shown that there are really some 
theoretical effects which might uh, if 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 held to be true in the long run and translating into clinical benefit might be perhaps useful in uh, in alleviating some of the problems of patients with chronic kidney disease now what is the future the future is generation or or bioengineering of very specific type of uh, of bacteria uh, which might be uh, made for specific purpose for example if we identify that an individual has a specific type of uh, high levels of uremic toxins maybe we can alter that by giving them a specific type of bacteria uh, and so that is that is somewhere in the future but you know the chinese have always been ahead of uh, the rest of the world and they are already uh, selling these smart uh, bacteria uh, uh, probiotics prebiotics we also have prebiotics probiotics in indian market but please note that despite all that we have discussed in the last few slides there is really no conclusive proof as yet that either the prebiotics probiotics or symbiotics have led to any significant measurable alteration in any clinical endpoints so at this time one cannot recommend the use of probiotics and, and prebiotics either for uh, slowing down the progress of kidney disease or for symptom control or for uh, alteration in the cardiovascular risk profile or slowing down uh, the progression to develop uh, to a stage where a patient might require dialysis we are a long way from reaching that state but i think it is important to know that this is a field where rapid progress is being made and over the last uh, few years we have we have understood a lot and i think in the next few years we are poised to learn a lot more about uh, the microbiome and how to alter the mic microbiome all over the body uh, in favor of health rather than disease uh, not only in patients with chronic kidney disease but in people with other uh, disease conditions as well thank you very much for your attention